This is the brand new Coros Pace Pro, a watch that's been completely overhauled inside and out. In fact, it's almost nothing like the existing Pace 3. Both myself as well as my wife have been putting the Coros Pace Pro through its, well, paces over the last little while, swimming, cycling, hiking, running, you name it to see how well it actually works. So without just simply get right into it. The price is the very first thing to know. It jumps from 229 US dollars to 349 US dollars. And that might seem like a lot, and it is obviously, but I would say the watch is now much more appropriately priced. Priced. Although naming wise, this is basically now in the range of their Apex series, both in features, functions, and also kind of price. So I don't entirely understand why they named it Pace Pro as opposed to like Apex something else, but hey, Nonetheless, that's the price. So on to the main event it is, which is the display change. This is the first watch from Coros that has an AMOLED display. In short, AMOLED displays are much more brilliant, they're brighter, they're what you think of for like an Apple Watch or something like that. In the past, Coros has used MIP-based displays, uh, which have a longer battery life, generally speaking, but are kind of going out of style. With that new display, they've increased the size up to a 1.3 inch display. The Pace 3 had a 1.2 inch display. And this new AMOLED display is 1500 nits, which is a plenty bright display, whether it be super sunny out like it's been the last little while here or if you're trying to run at night etc no problems there whatsoever in fact that's one of the biggest advantages of an amoled display is that it's super visible and usable at night as opposed to most mid blaze displays can be a bit harder to see depending on the backlight of course we'll get into battery in just a second in my real world testing there as well the case size has also increased on this compared to the Pace 3, from a 42mm case up to a 46mm case. In fact, you'll notice on the side, the buttons are also increased as well. They're much more usable now. I find in the past they were kind of a little bit small uh, for my liking. They were still perfectly fine, but these new buttons are much easier to hit uh, when you're doing intervals and stuff like that. And since we're talking about physical things, you'll notice they've swapped out what was a fabric band in the past for a silicone band. Uh, so, in the past you always got that lightweight fabric band. Uh, that does mean the watch will now be heavier than it was in the past. Here are the stats down at the bottom. They're basically comparing if you had the fabric band on both of them. Uh, in the case of the Coros Pace 3, the fabric band was included. In the case of the Pace Pro, you have to buy it extra and you get the silicone band instead. So it's basically just flip from the past. Uh, but I actually like the silicone band. And hey, just a quick note, if you're finding this video interesting, useful, or something at all, just simply watch it all the way to the end. That's all the YouTube gods really care about these days. It just watch time and, and total, that, that's really all they care about. Meanwhile, one of the last physical things we'll mention is the fact a slightly changed charging port uh, and charging cable. In fact, you don't even get a charging cable at all. What you do get instead is basically this two part thing I just threw into the bushes. Uh, you get this little basically keyring adapter. So you get the keyring piece and then the adapter that goes inside of it. Not the first time Coros has done this. This means that you supply your own USB-C cable into this uh, and then from there this plugs into the back of the watch. But this little pluggy part is also new as well. It's slightly different than the past. Slightly deeper and slightly thicker than past ones. That means past cables won't work with this watch. At least not with a little bit of modification. If you do find yourself in a pinch on like a remote island or something and you've got a friend with an older Coros charging cable, you can just whittle down the outside rubber edge of that just slightly and it'll go ahead and fit into the deeper charging port on this new watch. Coros confirmed that would be technically fine. Not ideal, but technically fine. The reason they did that is they said that over time they found the charging connector got a bit kind of wobbly and loose on the cable to the connector portion of it. Sort of like the, the Garmin connector. One, one could kind of think that if they hadn't exactly copied the Garmin connector, they wouldn't find themselves in this predicament. But nonetheless, they're trying to fix that predicament going forward with a deeper, longer charging connector. Make sense? Good. Next, on the back, they've got a new optical heart rate sensor. Uh, this is the same sensor found in the Coros Vertex 2S that was launched this past spring, and I'll dive into the accuracy a little bit later on. But one of the things it brings with it is ECG. Though not a medically certified ECG from either the FDA or the CE, the European Union, uh, it does not do AFib detection in any way, shape, or form. So it's really just for you to look at the, the pretty squiggly line going up and down, and, and that's kind of it. Again, don't use it as a medical device. It is definitely not certified. In any way, shape, or form for doing that. Next, Coro says they've gone ahead and swapped out the GPS chipset inside of this, as well as optimized the antenna design compared to the Pace 3. Uh, as a result, you're supposed to get better GPS accuracy. And I'm gonna go through that in the GPS accuracy section. Uh, but in short, yeah, it's, it's definitely better than in the past across a number of different sport areas. Uh, however, there have been a couple catches to that. Uh, so the first thing though, is let's dive into the battery side instead of GPS, because here are the new battery claims there. Essentially in all systems mode, you get 30 
38 hours. And then in dual frequency mode, you get 31 hours. There is no longer just like a base GPS mode that you can use. It's either one of those two. They want you to have better GPS across the board, which I'm good with. That said, I've had a couple problems with this. Uh, number one, I had one outdoor ride where I got 10% an hour battery burn, which basically means obviously 10 hours of battery life in dual frequency mode. Chorus took a look at that data and said, whoa, that's, that's not good at all. And they found a bug in the GPS firmware, which basically got into this like race condition, conflicting condition, which ultimately led to horrific battery life. As a result of that bug that I found, they've gone ahead and tweaked the GPS firmware for everyone to reduce accuracy uh, for the next little while. A little while being like either a few days or a couple weeks at most until they can resolve that issue uh, with the GPS chipset provider. So with that new firmware, I'm getting about 5% an hour in dual frequency mode with some sort of navigation enabled, which is more like 20 hours uh, battery life than it is the you know 30 or so they claim for dual frequency, but I am having navigation enabled, which will definitely impact things. Thus, once that final Final GPS fix has been implemented, I'll have to take a closer look at things and see if it changes. Meanwhile, on the smartwatch side of battery life, they claim six days for always on display and 20 days for gesture display. With the gesture based display, there's essentially two modes. Always on is what I have it on now, where you can see the time even when my wrist is down and then I'll raise my wrist up, it goes to full brightness there. Uh, versus gesture based means my wrist is like this, the screen goes black and thus you get more battery life the 20 days. That six day claim, I'm pretty close to that, maybe a little bit under that. I've been doing one to three hours of GPS workouts per day. Um, and as a result, I'm burning more battery life, but I'm getting about like four days of total smartwatch battery life in always on mode. I haven't tested gesture mode because I frankly don't like it. I just want to see my, my time all the time. Now let's get into the big ticket item, which is the addition of maps. Uh, so the Pace 3 did not have maps. Instead, that was saved for the Apex and Vertex series. This now has downloadable maps on it. You basically just go into the Coros app, you choose the region you want, tapity tap, and using either Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, it'll download those maps to your watch. One of the things I really like about Chorus's map downloader is you can do really small sections. Uh, so for example, here uh, in Mallorca, I can download the entirety of Mallorca and nearby islands in like 60 megabytes, which is absolutely nothing. So once you have the maps on there, you just simply download a route onto the watch, just like you would in the past. That comes from Strava or Komoot or even the Chorus app itself. Uh, those routes you can then follow using a little line that you see right there. And it'll also give you turn by turn prompts for some, but not quite all of those turns. It's not, it's not great there, but it'll at least tell you when you're off course, it'll give you an off course deviation warning. Now, because these maps are not routable, uh, it won't route you back on if you go off course. You have to basically kind of use the watch and figure out where you are and just sort of aim back onto the trail there. Additionally, there's no names today on there. So things like trail names, road names, lake names, etc. But Cora says that's coming next year in quarter one, which will certainly be nice to have. Overall, all this works just fine. It's not as good as some of the maps that have all the extra data and do routing and stuff like that. But you know, it's been perfectly fine for me to get through the trails and stuff like that. And hey, just a quick note, if you see some lines on the screen in this review, you're not seeing those with your actual eyes. That's a camera issue. It's really kind of a, a shutter issue, basically matching the refresh rate of the camera to the watch. Most of the companies spend a whole lot of time making sure you don't see those lines by basically avoiding that kind of refresh issue. Coros hasn't, hasn't done that yet. And it's been a huge struggle to get good clean pictures, especially in sunnier conditions. Indoors, I can kind of get them without a problem, but once I'm outside, it's nearly impossible to get good clean images, uh, except for really low light times of the day. Okay, next up is that Coro says they've doubled the processor speed of compared to the Pace 3, and in general made the whole thing a lot faster. Honestly, when you're looking at like the menus and stuff for the Pace 3, there's absolutely no difference whatsoever. They're both equally fast, like they're perfectly fine. Uh, they're exactly the same. However, when you compare the map speed to something like the uh, Apex series or the Vertex series, you definitely notice as you scroll through the maps, it is way faster now in terms of rendering those maps. So kudos there on that one. But for everything else, you, you won't notice at all. Likewise, they also increased the storage from four gigs to 32 gigs. That's mainly gonna be used for maps, of course. So their maps are super small, so you're never gonna use that 32 gigs. Like, I'd be impressed if you can get anywhere even close to half of that, let alone the full 32 gigs. Instead, you'd be using it for music, but it only supports MP3 style music files on here. No streaming services like Spotify or YouTube Music or Amazon Music, etc. And honestly, they're never gonna get that. Uh, those like castle gates, those castle walls closed 
years ago, and Coros is way too small of a company to even be considered. You're talking millions and millions of units per year to be shipped to even like have that meeting, let alone actually get it done. So unfortunately, Coros is largely going to be limited to uh, those MP3 style implementations. That said, they could easily implement a podcast style implementation to pull in podcast files, and they haven't done that today. So that's something they could do that would kind of bridge that gap a little bit. 60 to 90 seconds walking through the user interface very briefly, just so you can get a feel for the watch. Okay, here we are on the watch face itself. You can use a digital crown right there to scroll through things. These are my daily stats right there. Then I've got my running fitness levels. I can click back by pressing this button right there. Go down to my training load. My one annoyance here is that training load resets every single Monday. Training load doesn't reset every single Monday in real life. It should be the last seven days trending like most other companies, but every Monday morning it gets reset. Um, and I look at my distribution over the last little week, little week, I guess the last big week, uh, as you can see, it was an excessive week according to Coros, which eh, probably makes sense given that this is excessive compared to my recent trends within the Coros platform. Heading on down, I've got my recovery time there. I've got my heart rate. I can crack this open, scroll back and see different heart rate values uh, over a time period. And then below that, we've got stress. And then we have my HRV status or heart rate variability. Uh, you can see it's normal right now, uh, kind of trending back down, which is a good thing. And then back again here, this is my sleep last night. Uh, so six hours and six minutes of sleep and then my sleep stages and sleep phases. Uh, the actual times I went to sleep or fell asleep and woke up have been spot on. I didn't do any sort of validation of these sleep phases or stages because the comparative tools to do that aren't really all that accurate to begin with, only in the mid 80 percentile. We would never compare heart rate sensor data or something like that to something that's only 80 percent accurate. In any case, back here, we got some kind of general stats. Uh, you got your altitude, you've got your sunrise, sunset time, pressure, uh, weather, and then up here at the top, you can press this button to start a sport mode. This is where you can go through and choose all your sport modes. I can go down to run, for example, tap that open. It's going to find GPS up here, and then down there, it's going to lock my heart rate. I can add in a structure work if I want one or two down below. I can go to navigation and add in one of my courses. Uh, there's a Sunday Lighthouse course that I showed earlier on. And then once it's got my heart rate and GPS lock, I just simply press start right there to get going. And you can see the data pages that I've configured previously. You can customize all these data pages on a per sport profile basis, including which exact data field you want to see on these data pages. And again, you can add more data pages or remove them if you want. And then once it's done, you press a stop button, you'll see a summary or workout like you see right here from my trail run yesterday. Uh, all the stats from that particular run. Uh, heart rate, uh, my power zones, running power zones that is, my elevation right there going on down more, you got activity time, recovery time, and so on. Anyway, just a really quick little overview of the watch. Okay, now let's look at the GPS accuracy and the heart rate accuracy with those new sensors. Starting on the heart rate side first, we'll get right into it with some intervals. Here is a trainer interval I did, so an indoor cycling trainer. It's no problems at all. A little bit of delay on some of the recoveries there, but no problems. Uh, then if we look at this outside run that I did, uh, this is a trail run, and so basically a lot of ups and downs there. So kind of like an impromptu interval workout. Again, really solid on this across the board. No real issues on this at all. And then we look at some legit intervals, basically actually some structure, short, some two minute, one minute and 30 second intervals and very good across the board. But you can see a little bit of latency on the recoveries of some of those shorter intervals. Uh, we're just coming down from those peaks. It's kind of a bit slow there. Somewhat common for optical sensors, uh, but not too bad. Whereas if I look at this 12 minute interval here, there's really no problems at all because I'm not as high of an intensity of a heart rate uh, and things are looking like spot on perfect right there. However, once we go cycling outside, it all falls apart. The struggle bus was real right here. Here, and you can see it was a complete dumpster fire across the board, which a lot of watches really do struggle outdoor cycling. Uh, but this is this is a lot worse than most other watches. Uh, but everything else was great. So just, you know, get a, some other sensor if, if you're going to go cycling outdoors. So then what about GPS outside? Let's start off with some easy stuff here. Uh, this was an interval run, basically loops around an area without any tall buildings or anything like that. Uh, pretty much spot on. I thought it was interesting to look at this kind of turn I did. We did this over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, and you can see that the Coros uh, Pace Pro was really good in terms of how close those lines were each time around this little sidewalk section. And I was on a very skinny little sidewalk on this section. So I knew it was in the exact same spot every single time. And it did a very solid job of that. So let's increase difficulty and go out on a trail run. Uh, and here we can see this is actually with the newer firmware that I mentioned, uh, the one that reduces the accuracy just slightly. And at a high level, you're like, ah, that looks fine. And you zoom in a bit more, you're like, yeah, that still looks fine. 
but once you get down to really zoomed in, you see there's a very slight offset there across the board on this GPS track of like maybe two to four meters compared to all the other watches I had on there. Uh, again, not a huge deal, but I think maybe some of that sacrifice that had to be made to go ahead and reduce that other GPS bug. Next, let's go back outside outdoor cycling uh, to that one that had all those GPS uh, battery burn problems. Now, despite the battery burn problems, the accuracy was really, really good. This is up in the mountains with steep cliffs on both sides and in really sharp 180 degree turn switchbacks back and forth at speed. And across the board, it is matching the higher end bike computers without any problems as well as higher end watches. So kudos there, even though it burned through all the battery life, it got the GPS track spot on. So last but not least, we've got an open water swim. And this is notable because this is the very first time ever Coros has managed to cobble together a reasonably accurate open water swim session. Every other watch I've tried of theirs has failed in some way, shape or form. This time, it's pretty darn good. It's not perfect. If you zoom in, for example, on some of the turns, you see it's kind of shorting them a little bit there. Not a huge amount, and I wouldn't really stress about it, uh, but this is a huge improvement from Coros uh, compared to their past watches. So overall, I think that both the GPS and the heart rate sensor are pretty solid across the board. I don't really have any major complaints there outside of the areas I just outlined. Thus, where do we stand in terms of the watch? Well, at 349, it's competing against the Sunto Race S. It's competing against the also just released Polar Vantage uh, M3 at 399. Uh, the Race S is at 349. And it's competing against the Garmin Forerunner 265, which is in the $400 plus range. The only check is, the only catch, of course, being the 265 it doesn't have mapping on it, but it has a bunch of other features instead. In fact, I've got a separate video I'm working on comparing all four of these watches because they are both really similar, both in price as well as features, but also very different at the same time, depending on what you're looking for. Still, in terms of the Pace Pro, it is, I would argue, probably Coros's best watch today. Yeah, I know you got the Vertex up there at the top end, but honestly, like this is getting better accuracy for me, both in GPS as well as heart rate. It's got the mapping you need. And once you talk about the Apex and the Vertex series, you're really only gaining a few minor extra things at the top end, things like the rock climbing modes, which I'm not personally using. And of course, the longer battery life uh, associated with that mip based display. But for most people, 31 to 38 hours of claimed GPS battery time is more than enough on this watch today. Overall, kudos to Coros. I think they really stuck the landing on this one and found a pretty solid price that uh, I think will do well long term. With that, thanks for watching.